All right, the first pathway that we're going to look is with that alpha S um, subunit. Sometimes, in fact frequently, I refer to this as the GPCR cyclic AMP pathway. So please know both of those. That's an A, not a Q. Okay. Please know both of those terminologies because I use them interchangeably. Alpha S is going to be just like any G protein coupled process. In its inactive state, alpha S will be bound to, let's throw an S in here. Let's see if we're going to squeeze that in here. Alpha S is going to be bound to the receptor. When a ligand binds, that alpha S will exchange GDP for GTP. My GTP got lost a little bit, so I'll write that in there. And it will float over, and let me go ahead and draw the little squiggle that represents it being anchored into the lipids. It'll float over to adenyl cyclase, which is also found at the cell membrane. Now, adenyl cyclase is an enzyme. It also, as I've mentioned, is something called an amplifier. Because what it's going to take is a relatively small signal. We've got one ligand, one receptor, one alpha S. Okay. And a relatively small signal then. And it's going to magnify it. What this does is adenylate cyclase uses up a whole bunch of ATP. And every ATP gets, that gets used, we produce more and more of this molecule called cyclic AMP, CAMP, or sometimes CAMP. This cyclic AMP is a second messenger. And cyclic AMP will bind to another protein. Now the protein that it binds to are these ones shown over here. Let's try a different color that'll show up. What these proteins are is collectively they're called docking proteins. which is a generic term for proteins that hold something in place. What these docking proteins do is bind to an enzyme called PKA. This is PKA. And when these docking proteins have PKA in a complex like that, PKA is inactive. PKA, by the way, stands for protein kinase a, and I've already told you what kinases do. Kinases attach phosphates onto other molecules. But what happens with these cyclic AMP is they actually come over here and they sit down in these binding sites here. And when they bind to these docking proteins, they change the shape of the docking proteins and by changing that shape, they change the affinity of the docking proteins for PKA. And as a consequence, when that happens, PKA is allowed to run free. And so we actually have it running in... floating around in the cytosol, activating whatever it happens to, or phosphorylating whatever happens to fit in its binding site. Meanwhile, these docking proteins just kind of hang out waiting for PKA, waiting for the signal to go away. And PKA, once activated, one of the things that it can do is enter into the nucleus. And in the nucleus, we happen to have, do you guys remember my drawings? where I talked about transcription factors and how those transcription factors can hang out in the cytosol or sometimes they hang out in the nucleus. 
Well, there's this transcription factor known as CREB. And I'm going to just put TF for a transcription factor. And it's going to hang out. And in its unbound state, it's not active. It's inactive CREB. But PKA comes along and attaches a phosphate to it. And when that happens, PKA can now bind uh, another pro protein or a ligand, you could say. And that's this little orange guy that looks like a little hat. Okay, this is the ligand that binds. And that complex then in turn binds to this region right here, which happens to be a regulatory region. And so it's going to recruit a bunch of other proteins to this site and ultimately recruit RNA polymerase to begin the process of transcription. And so the net result of this whole process is to get transcription and therefore translation, which results in the upregulation of specific proteins. And those proteins will change the behavior of the cell, modifying its activity in some way. And these types of changes will help our bodies to maintain homeostasis. Now, just like before, I mentioned that cyclic AMP does not stay forever in the cytosol. So we actually do have another enzyme and I want this to sound familiar to you. We have these other enzymes uh, called phospho diesterases. And those phosphodiesterases chew up my cyclic AMP. And as soon as the cyclic AMP are no longer bound to the docking proteins, it's going to grab up the PKA and it's going to inactivate it. And so the cyclic AMP is chewed up by this phosphodiesterase and removed from the cytosol. Now, if my alpha stays bound to the adenylase cyclase, the adenylase cyclase will just make more. But as we know, that GTP is going to be hydrolyzed into GDP. And once it's hydrolyzed into GDP, now we're going to go back to my receptor. And again, if my ligand is present, we're just going to repeat this process. And so we go right back to making more cyclic AMP. And so we have this battle between adenyl cyclase and phosphodiesterase to keep the concentration of cyclic AMP high in the cytosol. As long as ligand is bound, adenyl cyclase will continue to make that cyclic AMP and will win this war. But when that ligand floats away, then when alpha comes back, it's going to stay there. And adenylase cyclase will no longer make cyclic AMP. And phosphodiesterase will remove cyclic AMP from solution. By the way, beta and gamma will go back. I put them over here just to get them out of the way, but they do cool stuff. Cool stuff that for time's sake we're not talking about. And so we have this process, this mechanism to regulate and control even the production of these second second messengers. Quick for your G whiz collection, fa caffeine, our good friend caffeine, uh, inhibits phosphodiesterase. And so if there's less phosphodiesterase, there's more cyclic AMP, which is associated with the increased alertness that we experience.
That's not its only target. Caffeine is what we call a dirty drug, which means it has several different protein targets, but that is one of them. And that's just for your GWIS collection. I'm not going to test you on that. So that is my Alpha S or GPCR cyclic AMP pathway. I've left out a lot of details, a lot of details, so that you don't have your mind blown. But these are the important processes, important general steps that occur with these molecules, these, um, this particular type of G protein. Now alpha, here what I'm doing is, so I scribbled all over this, I did draw, drew it out, I talked about it, and now really what I'm just doing is putting it step by step by step in a list. So our first step is that the ligand binds the receptors. The receptor causes the G protein to release the GDP which and bind GTP. The G protein is activated, it releases beta and gamma, and it detaches from the receptor. Now my G, G protein binds to adenylocyclase. Adenylocyclase converts ATP into cyclic AMP, which is a second messenger. Cyclic AMP binds the docking proteins that hold on to PKA, and when CAMP binds these, PKA is released and becomes active. PKA phosphorylates other proteins, including a protein called CREB. Phosphorylate, phosphorylated CREB goes to the nucleus and binds to the DNA to stimulate gene transcription. Meanwhile, back at the adenylase cyclase, the protein, G protein hydrolyzes GTP, converting it back to GDP. Everything becomes inactivated. G protein goes back. Cyclic A and P is degraded by another enzyme name, not important. Let's cross that out. Well, I don't know. Probably I'll give this to you. Okay, but phosphodiesterase. And that, in a nutshell, is the entire process from start to finish. Now phosphodiesterase, I wanted to mention that. Let's go back up here. And I want you to look at this. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Blah. Anyway, can you see? There we go, finally it worked. The Alpha I, which inhibits the actions of Alpha S, one of the ways it does that is by stimulating phosphodiesterase, which phosphodiesterase eliminates cam CAMP. And so it makes phosphodiesterase much more effective, so it does a better job of getting rid of CAMP, and a little cyclist can't keep up. And so this entire process is suppressed. And so that's one of the ways I kind of want to bring it home and help you see how these can help regulate and modify each other. Now the next pathway I'm going to cover is this alpha Q, also known as alpha 11. So let's go ahead and add my 11 in here. Alpha Q and alpha 11 are actually two different proteins, but they fit the same pattern and so they're referred to sometimes as isoforms of each other. Once again, this is an overly simplified process. Okay. There's a lot going on in these cells, but we'll just generalize here. And so again we begin our journey with the binding of a ligand to the receptor. And when that ligand binds the receptor, the receptor changes conformation, which causes a change in alpha, which causes alpha to release its GDP and bind its GTP, which activates the alpha. Beta and gamma float away, 
and as mentioned, cool stuff happens. Okay. Now alpha, just like before, is going to leave the receptor. It's anchored into the plasma membrane, just like before. It's going to travel to the plasma membrane where it's going to find another protein that happens as it glides along that plasma membrane, as it floats along. It has this other protein that is also lipid anchored. And that other protein is phospholipase C. There are a variety of different phospholipase C's, although they all do similar things, but this one in particular is phospholipase C beta. I'm not going to require you to know that on the exam. Phospholipase C is good enough for me. Now what phospholipase C does is phospholipase C, when alpha is bound to it, phospholipase C um, degrades a particular type of phospholipid called phosphoinositol. That's the only enzyme that it's really going to act on. There's plenty of phosphoinositol in our plasma membrane. We could assume, for example, maybe that one's that one, and maybe this one's one, and maybe this one's one, and maybe this one's one, and phospholipase C is going to degrade them. Here we actually have kind of a cheesy magnification of this phosphoinositol where you can see this is my phosphate head right here. This whole complex is my phosphate head and then these little things here are supposed to be my fatty acid tail that embeds into that phospholipid membrane. So we blew it up so you can kind of see that phosphate head. Now what this phospholipase C does, it's going to cut, we're going to slice and dice right about here, okay, and it's going to create from that process two molecules. One is a lipid called diacylglycerol, okay, diacyl, oh actually do I really want to spell it, diacylglyceride. I don't think that's spelled right, so I probably shouldn't have tried to spell it. We're going to abbreviate that DAG. Now this is a second messenger in its own right. And this second messenger binds to, it's kind of interesting, it binds to a, a kinase. And the kinase tends to be floating in the cytosol. But when it binds the diacylglycerol, that kinase actually moves to the membrane and is now suddenly a lipid anchored protein. So diacylglycerol is important in bringing that phospholipase or that um, protein kinase C to the membrane. But diacylglycerol by itself is not enough to activate it. Its job is to change the location. Okay. In addition to the diacylglycerol, we're actually going to need a molecule, which you should know and love, called ca uh, calcium. But here's the thing about calcium. In a normal cell, calcium concentrations in the cytoplasm are very, very, very low. And I should probably say that that's at rest. Okay, Incredibly low. And it's kept low by a pump that is not shown here, but I'm going to draw it in. This pump here called the calcium ATPase. Yes, it's using ATP. And so every time it encounters a calcium molecule, it's going to take this and using ATP, it's going to force it into the endoplasmic reticulum. Well, in the endoplasmic reticulum, my calcium concentration is high. So my calcium concentration is really, really high. So we now have this concentration gradient where calcium, if it were allowed, would move down its concentration gradient into the extracellular or into the cytosolic environment. 
But it can't just cross the phospholipid membrane. It needs to cross by facilitated diffusion. So there's a gated channel here. And you'll recall that gated means when it's inactive, it's closed. Calcium can't get through a closed channel. So during this signaling process, when ligand is bound, okay, and alpha is activated, and PK, PLC is activated, and diacylglycerol is being produced, the other molecule that's being produced comes from that phosphate head. It's actually this inositol portion. And the inositol, when it's cut off of the phosphate, or of the phospholipid, um, produces what is called inositol 3 phosphate, or IP3 for short. And IP3 is also a second messenger. IP3 comes down here, and IP3 is my ligand for a calcium channel found in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so when IP3 binds, that channel opens. And when that channel opens, calcium is allowed to move out of its concentration gradient into the cytosol. And so the concentration in my cytosol changes. That concentration of calcium now increases. And that's good because calcium is the other part. It's the other thing that we need to activate this pKa. And so this pKa, it's a kinase, and so it will in turn phosphorylate other molecules, other proteins. And eventually we end up in the nucleus once more with another transcription factor activated and once again, we get gene transcription. Now, one of the reasons I'm showing you this particular pathway, just to kind of prime that pump again, is that this is going to be really important in smooth muscles. Okay. We also see a little of it, this in um, cardiac muscle. So we're going to revisit this particular signaling pathway and we're going to add more detail to it. For this exam, this is the level of detail that I want you to know. But for priming the pump, okay, I'm going to tell you that there's also another receptor on the endoplasmic reticulum. We find this exact same receptor in both skeletal muscle cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. And that receptor is called the ryanodine receptor. And in smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, that ryanodine receptor is activated by calcium, believe it or not. And so the calcium will bind to it and open that channel. The cool thing about this is that when that channel is open, it lets more calcium out. So this is almost like a miniature positive feedback process. And so we actually call this, we have a name for it, we call it calcium induced calcium release. or CICR for short. I'm not going to really dig in and test you on that, but I want to present that to you as something that can happen. And so we end up with calcium being released thanks to the IP3 receptor, and that calcium will bind the PKC, but some of that calcium is also going to come over here and bind the, the ryanodine receptor. And so we get an amplification of the calcium signal. In smooth muscle, that would lead to contraction.
and cardiac muscle that would increase the force of contraction. Um, and so it's kind of an important thing to look at and see, but um, we'll revisit that concept. Once again, I know this is a long video, sorry, we're almost done with the G protein coupled receptors. Once again, I just kind of spell it out for you. And rather than read this to you, you can read it one by one. Now when the signal is lost, when the G protein returns to its receptor and we stop making diacylglycerol and, and uh, IP3, um, these are eventually degraded. And again, the enzyme name in this case is not, um, the specific enzyme name is not important, but Phospholipases would help with the degrading of diacylglycerol. IP3 would need to be degraded by something else. And again, just as a reminder of how this all fits together, notice that phospholipases are also here. Now for sake of completion, I guess, I should probably note that sometimes these processes actually activate the ion channels. Often it's the beta and gamma that do these. And so we can kind of skip a lot of the steps and just open a calcium channel directly from the plasma membrane. Um, just kind of be aware of that. We're not going to test or worry about it too much, but I just know that sometimes our beta and our gamma do things that either enhance or modify these processes in some way. And I think that's it for the alpha uh, subunits. So let's 